Okay. okay, so good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna kick off tonight. Thanks everyone for joining us as we uh, as we honor Nancy. And uh, just to kick it off, welcome to the 2020 History Makers Awards Part Two. Uh, my name is Steve Dyer, and I've been so lucky to be invited to be the host for this evening. Uh, we really appreciate that you've all joined us in this uh, virtual universe to show your support for our organization and for this year's History Maker and Lavender Rhino Award honorees. Uh, the mission of the History Project is to document and preserve the history of Boston's LGBTQ communities uh, and to share that history with LGBTQ individuals, organizations, allies, and the public. Um, so if you didn't know, now you know. That's the official description. So much of what the History Project does is about creating spaces for people to come together around LGBTQ history and life. Um, and in this year, with everything that's happening, a uh, year filled with so much more than ever before, the History Project has been working hard to create spaces online where community members can come together uh, to talk about LGBTQ history, uh, to meet others interested in LGBTQ history, and to, well, uh, let's see if we can have some fun and also dedicate one hour to enriching our souls. Uh, since April this year, History Project staff and volunteers have hosted 18 virtual Out of the Archives events that have reached a combined audience of more than a thousand people from all around the world. Recordings of these virtual events are available to all uh, to freely access on our YouTube page where they've been viewed by more than 2,000 people. And tonight, you'll hear a little bit more about the volunteer-driven work of the History Project. Uh, you'll have a chance to meet some of our other attendees. And finally, you'll hear from our History Maker awardee, uh, Nancy Nangeroni. From creating Gender Talk Radio and Gender Vision, to organizing the Transgender Day of Remembrance, to her service as chair of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, her activism has made history. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to introduce History Project board member, Anna Clutterbuck-Cook, who will discuss one of the organization's current digitization initiatives. And then after that, we'll hop into breakout rooms to do our best impersonation of a cocktail party schmooze fest, like we normally get to do in other years. Okay, Anna. Hey, Stephen. Um, I'm Anna Clutterbuck-Cook. I'm a reference librarian at the Massachusetts Historical Society here in Boston. Uh, queer feminist historian and have uh, served at the, at the History Project as a volunteer since 2018. Um, and tonight I'm going to briefly highlight some of the collections that the History Project makes available online, easily accessible through our digital repository. And uh, Joan is going to put a link to the digital repository in the chat if anyone is interested. Um, and I will also put links to the specific collections I'm going to highlight as well um, at the end of this um, brief introduction. Also, the History Project has almost 200 unique collections in the archives. Um, only a fraction of those have been digitized, but these digital materials offer a glimpse into Boston's unique LGBTQ history. For example, our, other, our Boston's Other Voices radio program archives has over 70 radio interviews with members of Boston's queer community. Boston's Other Voice ran from February 1981 to November of 1989 and was hosted by Dennis Idrola and Peter Stickle, who both um, who spoke with many different facets of the queer community, from leaders of queer organizations to gay couples who had been partnered for over 30 years, to young lesbians, to gay doctors, politicians, journalists, artists, and musicians. Another recent collection that has been made available are the gay community news photographs. In these photographs, originally taken for gay community news, the national meets local and the historic meets the typical. One image from the collection features Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, San Francisco-based activists and founders of the lesbian feminist group Daughters of Belitis, chatting with the Boston chapter of DOB. Another captures a group of Boston DOB members mid-pitch playing softball. The photographs are a visual tour of LGBTQ life in Boston in the latter decades of the 20th century, serving up vignettes of both community activism and community fun. The Boston chapter of Daughters of Belitis published Maiden Voyage, later renamed Focus, beginning in the late 1960s and into the early 1980s. And thanks to a student intern, Olivia Herman, we recently digitized all of the issues that the History Project holds of this publication. 
and are currently working to make those publications available online. These newsletters offer news from around the country, advertisements from gay owned and gay friendly businesses, community photographs, opinion pieces, poetry, prose, and classified ads. Newsletters like these provide a glimpse into the daily lives and social networks of queer women in Boston 50 years ago. While we can't digitize everything from the archives, we are committed to ensuring that all of Boston's LGBTQ communities are represented in our digital spaces and have made plans to, co uh, in collaboration with the Transgender Digital Archives, um, with the Digital Transgender Archives, sorry, um, to make our uh, four of our key trans collections more accessible. The records of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, the Transgender Initiative, the International Foundation for Gender Education, and the Tiffany Club. What we need now are sufficient funds to support the labor of digitizing these materials and adding them to the DTA. What we once described in mimeographed newsletters or shared through consciousness raising presentations made with the aid of a slide projector in a darkened church basement, we can now make accessible through the networked data streams of the internet. As communication scholar Kate McKinney argues in their forthcoming Information Activism, a queer history of lesbian media technologies, digitization efforts like these are part of a long history of modern queer movements efforts to provide access to information and through information community. For sexual and gender minorities, McKinney argues, access to good information helps determine a life that is livable. Finding information means finding deeply needed forms of support experience can offer a transformative invitation to community. I invite you to explore our queer history and to consider how you can support our mission to document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history, either by no donating your time, your collection, or your financial support. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Anna. Um, and so now we're gonna hop into breakout rooms. And before we hop into breakout rooms, I want you all to know that Joan, um, has been spending hours on the seating charts for these breakout rooms and she has created a very fun clue-like game. So now when you go into these breakout rooms, everyone in there with you is gonna have a very secret attribute that everyone shares in common. Uh, it could be your star sign, it could be your favorite Madonna album, it could be your go-to order at, uh, at Subway for whatever sandwich or wrap you prefer. Um, so see if you can figure it out because Joan is not only a historian, she also has psycho, uh, psychic powers. So have fun. I'd encourage you to put on your camera if you feel comfortable and you should also feel comfortable to just talk and ignore everything that I just said. So we'll see you in about uh, five or six minutes or so. All right, so are, are we all, Joan, are we all back? Uh, yes, I think so. I think everyone is back. Great. So everyone I hope who's coming everyone, back is back. <laughs> I hope everyone was able to figure it out. Um, if you want to stick your, what I would encourage people to do is if, if you did try to figure out what your secret attribute was, uh, you could drop that in the chat and I'll be, and I'll be grading those as we go along. <laughs> Very happy to announce that our breakout room figured it out almost immediately. Ooh. <laughs> We, you know, oh, is everyone in Virgo? I was like, oh no, we're a Libra. Um, and then the next thing was like, oh, do we all share a, a very core philosophical belief that life on Earth started with a single sequin? And we all <laughs> nodded along, and we're like, that's it, that's it. So that's so that so that's what we all shared. Um, and the, but the other thing that was that's so exciting is that Nancy's sister Terry is joining us from from Tucson. And it is her birthday. So oh. I would really oh, yeah. encourage everyone to unmute themselves and we'll sing happy birthday to Terry. Oh. And then, <laughs> if Terry can, then Terry can blow out this candle, this scented candle that I have. Ready? <laughs> Terry, her name's Terry. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, Oh, you did it! Yay! <laughs> <laughs>
Hopefully, we're not going to form a chorus after this. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough because there's a, it's the, uh, it's the delay. It's the delay. So I'll just, uh, going forward, I will just sing louder than everyone else, and it'll be fine. Okay. Um, okay so I hope everyone is uh, loosey goosey, made some new friends, and now I'd like to introduce Joan Alakwa, who is to my left in the Brady Bunch, and she's the executive director, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the history project. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for putting up with our uh, little getting to know you stunt. Um, I will never tell if you are correct or not, so you're just going to have to deal. I'm Joan Lacqua. I'm executive director of the History Project, um, and I'm taking a few brief moments to say thank you. Um, Andrew has a couple slides to share. Uh, first of all, to thank you, Nancy, for joining us tonight, and Gordine as well. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, and then I'd like to thank the History Maker Awards Planning Committee. And this year that included Carissa Cunningham, Andrew Elder, Ben Federlin, Tony Grima, oh, and my, my notes have disappeared, uh, Tony Grima and Jessica Taylor. We have been on so many Zoom calls trying to plan these events uh, awesome. for this month. Mm -hmm. So many Zooms, which I'm sure you can all uh, appreciate. Uh, what it takes to put this uh, together. And thank you so much to our MC, Steve Dyer, who is a delight as always. And then to just thank the members of the 2020 host committee without whom this event wouldn't be possible. That's a strange double negative. Um, first of all, those who contributed at our underground historian level, Libby Bouvier and Andrea Devine, Andrew Elder and Jose Ricardo McFallien Figueroa, Jim Gibson, Pat Gazemba and Karen Kahn, Tony Grimma and Peter Muse, Joan Alakwa and Sarah Marina, Marvin, Marvin Kabakoff, Mark Crone, Louise Rice, Martha Stone, Jessica Taylor, Ken Torino, and Christopher Matias. Then I'd like to thank those who contributed at our direct action documenter level, Bruce Bell and George Smart, Nan Dumas, Neil Kane and Charles Schoonmaker, Stuart Landers, Russell Lopez, and Andrew Sherman. And finally, the individual who contributed at our community curator level, Kevin Hepner. Thank you all so much for making this event possible, for supporting the work of the History Project. Thank you as well to those who joined the host committee at our friend of the History Project level, and everyone who's donated at every level. Literally every amount helps us to achieve our mission of documenting, preserving, and sharing LGBTQ history. So if you want to learn more about what we do or about our sponsors and our friends, please visit our website at historyproject.org. Um, host committee opportunities are still available. So if you're interested, please let me know. And now I'd like to introduce Nancy Nangeroni, one of this year's History Maker Award honorees. Nancy Nangeroni is an unmatched advocate for the trans community. From creating Gender Talk Radio and Gender Vision to organizing the Trans Day of Remembrance, to her service as chair of the Mass Trans, uh, of, wow, as chair of the Mass Trans Political Coalition, her activism has made history. Tonight, Nancy will be in conversation with Gordino McKenzie. Gordine is a gender activist dedicated to social and environmental justice, and also co-produced and co-hosted Gender Vision Video and Gender Talk Radio. So Nancy and Gordine will be in conversation with each other, and then toward the end of that conversation, we'll have a chance to ask questions, to add our own recollections, and I'll moderate that part of the Q&A. But without further ado, Nancy and Gordine. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Stephen, and of course, thank you for this award. It's, I'm honored and uh, flattered and embarrassed and all of that <laughs> stuff. And thank so. you for the work that you continue to do. We are deeply appreciative of it. So, um, where are we going to start? Nancy, <laughs> how did you become a transgender activist? Oh, <laughs> okay, so, um, and feel that. free folks to unmute yourself and steer us in a different direction. You know, if we, if we could start going off the rails, please pull us back. Or if curiosity comes up, if, so yeah, you want yeah, to yeah. know something. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, after many, many years as a closeted cross-dresser, I finally attended a transgender community event called Fantasia Fair in Provincetown. This is uh, uh, the longest running event in the trans community. Um, at the time I attended it, it was only affordable um, for trans people who were pretty well off and tended to attract um, white. a certain, yeah, white affluent 
trans people. And so I definitely came from that community. Um, being an engineer, MIT educated, I, my life has been pretty easy financially. Um, after that, though, I, I had such a, a heart shaking, earth shattering experience there for me coming out into the community and finding out that the transgender community, rather than um, a bunch of weirdos, which is kind of what I thought, you know, well, I didn't know there was a community. They were the first and, that you really met, right? Yeah, oh, the yeah. first trans people I really met. And I was blown away. I realized I'd found my community. And so I immediately started doing volunteer work at IFGE, the Inter International Foundation for Gender Education in Waltham, which was run by Marissa Sherilyn and Yvonne Cook Riley, two of the um, incredible, indefatigable, stalwart, compassionate, wonderful role model uh, leaders that we had in our community. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, Yvonne Cook Riley and Marissa Charlene, I learned so much from them. I joined the board of the organization eventually. Um, I even um, volunteered to run the organization for a while. I became the executive director after a while. Um, you were inspired but before then, by Marissa's writing, if yes. I remember. Yes. Who was one Are you of part of this conversation? <laughs> Who was, who was one of the first transgender people to write about being transgender, yeah. transgender issues? That's right. I had read uh, Renee Richards' book and I'd heard about Christine Jorgensen, yes. but I never read anything by a transgender person that seemed really um, just intelligent and respectable and just smart. And Marissa was an excellent writer and she um, so she gifted me with philosophy. Um, she considered herself she a philosopher and she was. Um, and so uh, then uh, I, st so I started going to conferences everywhere and I met somebody named Ricky Ann Wilchins. And uh, I also met some folks in Boston, um, at Hatfield in particular, um, who pushed me to do activism um, Ricky and I teamed up to, to lead a, uh, a, uh, pro, a, a demonstration in Falls City, Nebraska. Um, I don't know if I can, I'm going to try and show a picture. This was, um, okay, let's see if it shows up for you. Is it there? Yeah, yeah. we can see yeah. it. Yes. Awesome. So yeah, it looks weird on my screen, on our screen, but Anyway, this was um, the first time transgender people from around the country gathered together to demonstrate on behalf of a transgender person, Brian and Tina, who had been murdered um, in Falls City. And uh, this Kate here Bornstein. is Kay Bornstein uh, from right to left. Next to her is um, Kimberly Pierce, who went on to direct the movie Boys Don't Cry. Which, which won an Academy Award. Um, and K Kim Coco Ono sitting next to her uh, is a Hawaiian act, trans Native activist. Islander, yeah. yeah. Um, and this was uh, just an incredible, incredible experience to, you know, those of us who could afford to do it. Again, you know, it was those of us with some privilege um, who were able to fly to Kansas City and then rent cars and drive to Fall City, which was a two or three hours away. And uh, we didn't know if we we're gonna get met with baseball bats or worse, um, but it actually turned into quite a wonderful experience uh, where uh, we, a lot of people greeted us with smiles. A lot of people thought we were crazy and uh, you know, a bunch of people flipped us the bird and so forth, but it ended up being an incredibly empowering experience. And you had a conversation, if I recall, with a group of young men who came by in a truck who were shouting things. So there were these kids in a, in a pickup truck who were circling the block and having a shouting match with uh, uh, some of our members. And I was feeling responsible for what was going on there. And I went over there, what's going on? And they said, oh, we're, they were apparently one up each other with insults in kind of a jocular way. Um, 
kind of having fun with it. And then a camera crew asked me if, uh, if they could shoot uh, one of us talking to them. And so I, of course, I'll, you know, I'm big mouth and, and, and glutton for attention. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And um, so the, the kid stopped and the camera crew said, what do you think of these people? And the kid said, they're all crazy. They're all weirdos. They ought to be put away and whatnot. And then I, I said to the kids, hey, you know, we're people just like you. And, you know, we may be transgender, but we didn't ask for this. You know, it's just something, you know, it's just a part of us. And we're just trying to get by the best we can. And the kid, the kid was like, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't mean anything by it. We were just having fun. And so we, we got some wonderful coverage from that news crew and um, hopefully a bunch of people saw it. I don't know. Anyway, that was, this event just sent shockwaves through the community because we had people from all over the country and we all felt really empowered after this. We felt like, wow, we can do this. Um, we're not gonna get beat up for doing it. Um, we can stand up and say we're trans in the street. And so it, it, it led to a wave of activism, a wave of demonstrations at various places around the country. Um, and was everyone white that went at that time? Everyone was white Except at this Coco, demonstration. Who was a Native Islander. And understand that we knew that we were the lucky ones. We were very conscious of this, that our trans women of color were being kicked out of homes and, and living on the street, having to do uh, survival sex work, and were being targeted by murders. Uh, Ricky Ann Wilsons used to like to say that um, it was a kind of deranged violence that was um, wielded against transgender women of color. They would be overkilled many times over. Meant to obliterate them because of the racism, the inherent racism in there as well. So, and, and I mentioned Ed, At, Ed Hatfield earlier. He was, he kind of pushed me to do something with Boston Pride. So I joined the Boston Pride Committee. And because I was on the committee, they let me speak. And I organized a transgender contingent to participate. And I got to speak and say a few words. Um, and then we had a uh, transgender pride contingent from then on. And so um, Ed is, is still out there doing uh, his, activism and his work and he's just a wonderful thought leader um uh, so i guess the next thing uh to talk about would be gender talk radio did that did come after chanel pickett or before chanel pickett because when you came back chanel pickett was after so so i don't know if you got if you all noticed but some of the pictures that were shown earlier here um, were taken by Deb Rich. And Deb Rich was the host of a radio program on uh, WMBR in Cambridge at MIT, um, their radio station. Um, it was called Pride, Pride Time. And uh, then it, I think it was then called Say It Sister, or maybe I had that order it reversed. Was, it was Say It Sister. Gordine has a book here. Yes. <laughs> and, so anyway, the article we wrote a long time ago. <laughs> one day, Marissa Cheryl Lynn from uh, IFGE gave, gave me a call and said, you want to do a radio show over at MIT with me? Um, I live just a few blocks away. And I said, sure. And so we went and did the show with Deb Rich. And that was when I met Deb. And uh, then Deb had me back to do the show again um, sometime later, a few months later. And she mentioned that she was going to stop doing the show. She was looking for somebody to take it over. And that was where Gender Talk Radio came from. Um, I volunteered to do it. And then uh, there was a group of trans people that met in Cambridge, um, a place, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. that's a great one. Um, there was a group called AXA, AXA. I think we saw a picture um, of uh, transgender pride contingent in 1992. And AXA was on that side. Well, Ed was the one who was kind of running AXA. And, um, so I went over to AXA that week and I said, hey, you know, anybody want to help me do a radio show? And that's where I met Hal Fuller, um, who, if you've ever listened to the radio show, you know who Hal Fuller is. But anyway, he was he a did stalwart. The Twisted Nasty he news. engineered the show and did the Twisted Nasty News. And then we picked up Jamie Stull um, and uh, eventually Karen Larson and, and, and Ross Lippert and others. Anyway, so we did Gender Talk Radio. 
out of uh, MIT for a very long time. It was really um, a mediocre show, most striking for the fact that we were transgender voices on the air where there were none. But then in uh, 1999, Cordine McKenzie joined the show and it became a really good show. She started, uh, she bought, brought her academic background and her, her love of research and suddenly we started having amazing guests and um, just doing some great radio. But you did some wonderful things early on before I ever joined Gender Talk and uh, wasn't, didn't you have Robin Goldstein on as your first guest who is a transgender activist and didn't you get a telephone call uh, from someone asking uh, <sighs> <laughs> so we get, so Robin Goldstein yeah, was another MIT on. grad, and so she and I kind of clicked. She's another trans woman, um, um, although her identity has kind of gone back and forth through the years, but uh, we got a phone call during the, so I asked Robin to do the show with me, because she definitely has a gift for Gab, and she does her own radio show, and uh, part way through the show, we said, okay, we'll take calls, and uh, we didn't get a lot of calls, but one caller said, uh, you folks are all crazy. You ought, to, you ought to see a psychiatrist. And our answer for that was, well, the truth is, is that psychiatrists don't know anything about us. And in fact, <laughs> we're the ones who are teaching the psychiatrists about us. And that was the truth at that time. Right. Uh, and that, that was a period when being transgender, transsexual, or a cross-dresser was medicalized and was in the Diagnostic Institution's uh, manual and it was seen as a mental illness. And it took many, many years um, to remove it. So a lot of transgender people internalized that stigma themselves. Um, I had uh, helped with, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with the help of our uh, lesbian and gay center, uh, we started the first transgender support group because at that, and transsexual group, at that time, no one felt comfortable being out. And I always said, I'm a placeholder. When you're ready to do it, uh, you can do it. But people would drive around the block sometimes, and this is in the 80s and uh, kind of moving towards the 90s, drive around the block for six months before they felt comfortable to, being in, uh, to coming in. And people came out at a much later date then. And so yeah. it was a climate where, uh, people had been so stigmatized that they self-stigmatized and all the media reinforced it with uh, Psycho, Dress to Kill and, and other, other uh, productions as well. So in the mid nineties, the internet um, burst into being with web browsers and we put Gender Talk online um, with the help of Jamie Faye Fenton um, and who was a West Coaster who worked with, oh, what's the name of, uh, of uh, Joanne Roberts' is Renaissance? Renaissance, it was Renaissance. Um, anyway, uh, we started putting Gender Talk online and we developed an international listener listenership. And we had people from other countries contacting us. And we even had, um, was it Kyrgyzstan? I think, I think the most the, humbling we're, they wanted that, to come on. They wanted to be on the show. We're was... with people from trans people from Nepal and Kyrgyzstan. And in Kyrgyzstan, it was a young trans man who was in a very conservative Muslim country. That the story that he told was amazing. But the having gender talk was a place for voices that had been basically silenced and had not been heard where they were at the center. And so it was yeah, instead we tried, of- We tried to create a vehicle for other voices, not for our voices, no. but, although yeah. we know we like to talk. And so we, uh, we try to um, set up an arena where other folks can talk, where we can get other voices out there. So any voice that was underrepresented, we wanted to have on our program. Plus, of course, we wanted to have people like Barney Frank and, and other folks who were influential in the politics of what we're working on. And so we had him on to talk about ENDA and the trans community and trans inclusion and ENDA when that was a, 
a huge controversy. But transgender uh, activists form the core, transgender activists, artists, uh, yeah. writers, and queer, uh, uh, queer activists, uh, writers, artists form the core of who yeah. we're talking yeah. to. But we also employed an intersectional approach and we're really humbled by our guests because we had uh, First Nation people on talking. We had uh, union representatives that came on. And I remember an interview that we did now. Tom Barbera came yeah, on. I would, yeah. I would over-prepare. And Nancy would purposely say, I'm going to under-prepare. So we had two different things. And I had paper spread everywhere. Nobody could see us. We <laughs> <laughs> we, we often came in and we hadn't had time to wash our hair because I was, I was, oh, it was, radio. Yeah, I was the goodness. chair of the women's and gender That's studies That's the problem department. with gender vision. Yeah. When we started doing gender vision, yeah. then it was like, oh no, we have to do makeup <laughs> and all this other stuff. But we were so surprised and so heartened because what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk to people who were doing other social justice and human rights work. Yeah. And when we could connect with them, I remember a union representative at one point saying, um, you know, when we were going on strike and everything, members from the transgender community came down and they helped us. And at first we thought they were weird and now we think they're really wonderful. Okay. And it was, it was a real I want to talk moment. about, <laughs> Just to make sure we have time to get this in, I yeah. want to talk about Al Ferreira, Project Tenny, Sue Hyde, Chanel Pickett. Uh, uh, Chanel Pickett. There was so much that was going on in yeah. Cambridge in yeah. those days. Um, uh, Project Tenny at um, Cambridge Women's in Latin was just an amazing program for queer kids. And so I joined the, there. Uh, I don't know if it was a, an advisory committee or what it was. Um, and I met them through Sue Hyde, who was uh, one of the leaders of the Cambridge Lavender Alliance. And the Lavender Alliance um, basically elevated me to lead the, um, the passage of, the, uh, of, of an ordinance in Cambridge that, uh, uh, that uh, outlawed discrimination against people on the basis of gender. And Cambridge became the first place in the country um, to have a gender non-discrimination ordinance that um, explicitly said that um, that you cannot be discriminated against in places of public accommodation on the basis of your birth sex. We fought that out late in Massachusetts. Um, in 2011, we got the uh, non-discrimination law, statewide law passed in Massachusetts, Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, in coalition with all the queer groups around town, and all the social justice groups. Everyone pitched in. It was a wonderful coalition. And in 2011, uh, Patrick, uh, well, I think in January 2012, Deval Patrick. Patrick signed that bill. But then we had to come back because we were presented um, with a uh, choice. We had to choose between having no bill passed or having a bill passed without public accommodations. Um, some people advised us not to pass it without public accommodation saying that um, we would never then get together the coalition enough uh, support to pass um, another bill on public accommodations. But our queer partners in this at Mass Equality and GLAAD and um, all the other organizations, I'm sorry, um, they all assured us that they would not give up the effort and it was an incredible testimony to the power of coalition and trust among the leadership of the many social justice organizations in Massachusetts um, that we were able to accept the passage of that law without public accommodations and then have a successful coalition again come back and in 2016 pass the law that added uh, public accommodations to the non-discrimination law. That's Absolutely fantastic effort. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned those folks. And Rob Johnson, who's here on the call tonight, yeah. um, when in 1995, after we came back from um, the um, uh, Brandon Tina demonstration in Fall City, Nebraska, there was a trans woman, Deborah Forte, who was murdered 
up in Haverhill, and we had a demonstration there. And then that Paul Chanel Pickett was murdered um, in Watertown, and she was strangled to death in the in the in the uh, apartment of a of a young prep guy. And, it, and Chanel Pickett was African American. Deborah Forte was a white woman. That's right. White that's right. Gender woman. Yeah, Chanel Pickett was an African American woman, and um, so we demonstrated her child, and the judge uh, refused to allow testimony from uh, all the people that knew her. He allowed a, a little bit of it. But anyway, there was a terrible outcome from that case um, in 1997, uh, the, the same year that Cambridge passed uh, their ordinance. Um, and um, at the sentencing of Chanel Pickett, there was uh, uh, someone named Rita Hester was quoted uh, in, in uh, I think it was either in Newsweekly or I think it might have been in Newsweekly. She was quoted as saying, you know, this sends the wrong message that it's open season on trans people. And then in 1998, yeah. Rita Hester was murdered. Um, Gordon happened to be here in Boston at that time. We had just met um, in February of 98. She was here in uh, November, November of 98 when we got the call from uh, a reporter at the Herald asking if we knew Rita Hester. And Gordon um, helped lead the charge and um, helped us get a vigil organized. Um, for Rita Hester, um, which, uh, and then I engaged in an ongoing uh, battle with the press uh, over many weeks after that um, because of the way they were referring to Rita Hester. And that was pre picked up, I didn't know it at the time, but it was picked up on the national news wires. And all the way in San Francisco, a trans woman named Gwen Smith um, said, you know, we should have an annual Transgender Day of Remembrance. Sure, came and so that's that's how that all got started. Um, the first year I didn't I, I didn't take it seriously. I, I I in my wisdom I said, oh, this will never catch on. Uh, and uh, but I think the second, I don't know if it was the second or third year, it's probably the second year when I said I we can do better. Because I had organized a vigil for Chanel Pickett that had gone very well. We'd had a couple hundred people there. Whereas our first Transgender Day of Remembrance here, we had maybe 25 people and we didn't have an indoor space and stuff like that. So the second year, I got us into the Arlington Street Church and we had a lot of people and... Um, you led the vigil for Rita Hester initially yeah. with oh, her mother on I have a your picture. arm. Um, let me see if I can... Yeah, so yes. let's share that screen again. Yep. Um, share, let's see. Whoops. And Rita's mom, uh, her brother, and her sister uh, were in the vigil. I had to go back to Albuquerque. Um, but maybe you could uh, I've been, talk been about... been signed out. Are we signed out? Can you still hear us? Are we here? Yeah, yeah, you're still here. Okay. Oh, Zoom is crazy. <laughs> well, 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 anyway, okay. never mind any of that. Yeah. Yeah, can, and can we don't you, have to show the picture. You should it's show right. the picture. It's a powerful well, picture if you can. It, you know, I would love to show the picture. But it's not going to show. It's okay. just, you know, Zoom just isn't. Yeah. We can Nancy, yeah, see the picture. There there we're is. seeing the pictures right we now. We see a picture right now oh, of good. you and Rita's mom. Oh, thanks. Nancy yeah, it doesn't tell us called one way me the other. after the vigil, and she had got. Uh, after the vigil, she had put on her roller skates, and she she talked about how Rita's mom was. What what did she say? What Rita's mom remember? Oh, she was just when the vigil was the most moving thing ever. Yeah. Um, Rita's mom and Rita's brother and sister were all there, and so I was leading this procession. I had Rita, I had Kathleen Hester on one hand. Arm and Diana Hester on the other arm. And Daryl uh, was right there. Down Brighton Ave um, in Alston. And uh, her, her mom was just calling out, who killed my child into the night? And I thought it was such a generous sharing of her grief. Um, and it was so moving. And, it, you know, it was just an incredible experience. And when Nancy called me, she said you could hear uh, Kathleen's voice bouncing off the buildings and everything 
And as she started to tell me, I said, um, you should write this down. And she ended up um, writing a song about it. And, and then when Gordine came to live with me in Cambridge, she said, you should record that song. And so Gordine paid for studio time. And, it was a birthday gift. And we recorded the song. So it's out there. And then we made a video um, with Nancy doing that, but also showing pictures of Rita and uh, talking about the violence against transgender people. It was very short. It was a very short uh, piece. You can see it on, is it on the Gender Talk website or Gender Vision you can, website? It's on, you get the Gender Vision through gendertalk.org or gendervision.org. It's called In Memory of Rita. So, and, and yeah, I forgot to mention, you can listen to Gender Talk if you want or see what it was all yeah, about. Yeah, there are over 400 programs that are archived there that you can listen to free of charge uh, anytime. So we want, I wanted to mention to y'all, Marsha Garber, are you still with us? I'm looking. I think Marsha's not with us. Marsha gone now? Yeah. Marsha lost her husband to Ken um, shortly after the bill passed. Or was it before? Now I'm confused. No, it was, it was. Uh, Anyways, yeah. she and Ken gave testimony at the state house. Oh, they lobbied. Um, our legislators tirelessly. And when it came to advocating for transgender rights legislation, um, it turned out that our parents were our most effective advocates. Um, <laughs> apparently for lawmakers, you know, they're most convinced if a parent accepts a child. Well, their, their son had died. And so they were, they were Their trans teenage, son, transgender son yeah. uh, had died. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were amazing, tireless. And Ma Marsha continues uh, to be a tireless advocate to yes. this day. Um, what just wonderful folks. Um, let's see. So, you know, Transgender Day of Remembrance has been happening around Boston. And if you listen to last, last week's program, you know that Chastity and uh, I forget the other Athena. one's name. Athena Chastity will be working on it. Um, I know we're almost out of time. Oh, we are. I want to, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Transgender Resource Center in New Mexico because I think it's such an incredible organization and possibly an example that Boston could emulate. Um, so the Transgender Resource Center was started by two uh, trans men who started um, feeding homeless trans women out of the trunk of their car. And over time, they built an organization that um, now feeds, uh, we now have a walk-in center. We have our own building. Um, we have almost 9,000 square feet. We we feed, before the virus, we were giving hot meals every day. We have a, a number of computers for people to use. We have a large closet filled with tubs and each tub has a name on it. And each homeless person has a tub of their own so that they can have possessions that survive beyond the night, beyond the next they day's have, struggle. They have a mailing address? They, oh yeah, they have a mailing address. We have. Um, psychological counseling every week. We have someone come in to, for counseling every Nancy week. Who's we have a, more attractive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every, sorry, was there a question? Every week we have um, medical doctor in. Uh, we legal. we have legal counseling every week. We have HIV testing. Needle exchange. Needle exchange. Um, we're and trans prisoners. this organization has now started a thrift store, which has been up and running for a year and a half now, and is making a profit. So it is giving back to the organization. And it has been an enormous success story. The, the thrift store enables us, when we have someone who's living on the street, when they're finally ready to transition into a house situation, we're able to give them vouchers from the thrift store for everything they need for their home. When you first move into an apartment, there's nothing there and you need furniture, you need clothing, you need housewares and so forth. We're able to give them all of this and from jobs. the thrift store. We're also giving trans people jobs 
at the thrift store. And not every case has been successful. We've had some failures, but we've also had wonderful successes where we've been able to start people working and move them into housing and into a more, uh, a, a much more happy and successful life. So this is all this organization here what in New Mexico. Oh, well, one of, one of the two men, so it's Zane Stevens and Adrian Lawyer who run this organization. Adrian Lawyer is a former educator and he's done over 1,000 Trans 101 trainings around the state. And, uh, and he does them online now. Highly recommend, try one of his trainings, bring one to Boston. Uh, he's wonderful. Uh, Adrian Lawyer at tgrcnm.org. Um, but he also goes to prisons. Uh, we had the ICE Detention Center for Transgender People here in New Mexico for a long time. And we also have trans wards um, in prisons. And he goes to prisons um, every month, on a regular basis, every month at least. Um, we give trans prisoners stipends. We help put yeah, money right. in their um, in their accounts so they can buy supplies they need from the um, commissary. commissary. Um, when they get out of prison, when they're discharged, we give them a cell phone, we give them other possession. I don't, I, I don't even know what all the contents of the, of the bag are. I'm, these guys make me look so lame. I just want to tell you, it's incredible the work they do here. So I would, I would do anything to forge a connection between Boston and New Mexico. Um, to bring more of this to Boston. I think that All the chastity, chastity is someone who knows the others. needs of the girls, just like the guys, these two guys here knew what they, I never knew what the need was when I was in Boston, not for the girls who, were, who needed it the most. I knew they were there, I knew they needed it, but I didn't know how to help them. Now, at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, oh, uh, what's her name? Uh, there's a trans program at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And so we probably would do well to form a tie between them. Is it Pam at Boston Health? Pam Klein. Oh, yes, of yes, course. Pam That's Klein, true. of course. Yeah, she participated in the T door planning every year. She's a wonderful stalwart supporter. If we could get her and Chastity together, I don't know if they're working together, but. And Grace is doing a remarkable job. They're amazing people in Boston doing absolutely. great work. Absolutely. But you know, just and, and I'm in New Mexico. I shouldn't be telling y'all in Boston <laughs> yeah. what to do. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, forgive me if that, if that was presumptuous. <laughs> no, Nancy, Nancy and I were just really excited uh, about it. And there has been excellent work um, yeah. done it's in Boston. Very exciting. And there are many activists who we both have been inspired by. And one of them, of course, is uh, Grace. Yes. Uh, Chastity uh, as well. Uh, I have the utmost respect for you, Grace. Yeah. Just, you know, Grace was out and on the, out and proud in public long before I ever dared. <laughs> so. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have been tireless too. You've been at Bagley for how many years? 40 30, years. 40 now? <laughs> really? 40. Thank you. Thank you Grace. so much. Such Grace a resource. And of course, doing. Bagley benefits the trans community as well as the, the larger queer community. Yes. And now, of course, you're home, you provide a home for MTPC mm -hmm. um, and Trey Andre Valentine and his good work. And so I, I heard about Grace when I had a, trans, we had a transgender student who had been one of your Bagley people who now is a professor. Uh, in Arizona uh, uh, mm -hmm. and writing amazing books and doing yeah. amazing transgender mm -hmm. activism. And I remember hearing about Grace before I ever uh, <laughs> Before Boston. she met me. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that's got to be enough. Is that enough? Can we do <laughs> questions and answers? Do you know what time it is? I don't know. Yeah, it's 6.05. Oh. Yeah, we're only, we're five minutes after. We can, if you want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, I think we're happy to, to listen or I can start taking some questions from folks. Well, when I, uh, all right, let me do a couple of shout outs. Uh, one to Holly Ryan. Uh, Holly Ryan um, grew up in South Boston, knows the Boston area. She was um, chair of the steering committee or she and I became co-chairs co of the steering committee at Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. She eventually 
left there and got involved in politics and now she's a counselor, a counselor I think for Newton or a representative, maybe a state rep. State rep. Is she a state rep now? Uh, anyway. She's a counselor. Right? Yeah. Counselor. Sorry. Counselor. Counselor, yeah. yes. Not, right. not a state rep right. yet. Well, come on, Holly, get off the <laughs> stick, will you? No, wait. <laughs> so anyway, love you, Holly. And, uh, and uh, of course, there was uh, uh, Mason Bowen and Maxwell Ng and- Gunner. Oh. Diego. Diego, Diego. How could I, Alejandro Marcel. Alejandro. Uh, and how could I not mention Chirito, Scott, of course. Chirito Suarez. Oh, Chirito Suarez. She's yes. the one who shot the footage of the vigil for Rita Hester. We wouldn't have had a video without her, but Chirito Suarez, wonderful person. One of the things, Nancy, that. Trey Andre Valentine, by the way, at one of the, at a tea door in 2008. I'm sorry. That's okay. I got to tell the story. Um, I'd never met him before, and we were holding the, so the way we did Tidor was we gathered in a church. It was not religious at all, but we gathered in our church and did our remembrances and program, whatever it was, and then we would do our candlelight vigil through the streets. Well, we had a potluck, and we were making hot apple cider for everybody because it was cold out, and it was nice to have something hot when you came back in, and it was too late in the day for coffee. So... Anyway, Trey Andre volunteered to work in the kitchen. I had never met this guy before. He worked in the kitchen for the whole time. We were up in the sanctuary of the church having our um, program and all that. He missed the whole thing selflessly, worked down there in the kitchen the whole time. And I just thought this guy has some serious character and he cares about community. This is a wonderful guy. And who's now head of M Now M the head of PC. Massachusetts Change and right. Political Coalition. I just wanted to say that one of the things that, that I remember is uh, when I met you, you caught a lot of shade because the magazine, the Tapestry Magazine for the International Foundation uh, for Gender Education, long before you became its executive director, you insisted they put a trans man on the cover, and at oh, the yeah. time it was Leslie Fein Feinberg. <laughs> but uh, you know that was that was seen as a, a real revolutionary move. Also, you insisted that a lot of uh, white people stand back, and that you have women of color leading the Transgender Day of Remembrance because they are the ones that Absolutely. are most impacted Absolutely. and I, I felt that that was really you know very very important and, and I so welcome the emergence of, of people like Laverne Cox and Janet Mock who are such wonderful role models possibility models as Laverne would say for our community and who speak so well um, of the needs of our community and, and uh, trans women of uh, color as well, like Monica Roberts, who has been tireless uh, in Texas. Who was one of the first Colin out Park trans women of color on a national scene. Yeah. Who we just heard has passed away. No! 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 Uh, Did you say Monica had? Mo Monica Roberts. No, really? I'm so sorry. Just, just hours ago. Hours just ago happened. today? Oh, please, let's Aww. have a, a moment of silence for the work that Monica, Monica did. Okay, moment of silence, please. Wow. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's sad. There was, in, in my early days of activism, I remember just, just sort of, it was so much easier to come out as a person of privilege. And I just remember doing everything in my power to elevate the voices of people of color. Monica was one of the first. Um, and um, respected nationwide. Um, yeah, tireless Monica, work for our community. Yeah. Monica and I received an award together, the Tiffany Award. Did you? Yeah, there many, oh, the Trinity Award. Trinity Award, yeah, many, yeah. many years yeah, yeah. ago. And I want to say, too, that 
Nancy had been in a terrible accident, uh, which she writes about. She's working on a memoir and has her, her first uh, draft, but you um, wanted to show your legs on the cover of Tapestry to show the the wounded leg as oh well. <laughs> and you, you know, in, in terms of disability and everything, I thought that 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 was really important. Yeah, yeah, it was it was important to me to to have a picture. So so I was selected to be on the cover of this tapestry magazine, which was the one that Marissa Cheryl Lynn wrote in and that Yvonne Cook helped publish. And um, most of the cover photos were bedroom or um, you know, in private, and I wanted to do something out in public. Um, and yeah, so we, I had, I had been in a terrible motorcycle accident um, because I was so miserably closeted, shameful, and everything else that I really didn't care if I lived or died. And so I did crazy things. And, and uh, anyway, my, I have a terribly, I have a seriously disfigured leg with a lot of scarring and stuff. And and I did feature it on the cover shoot. It's a little bit subtle because I am wearing stockings. But, but I felt it was very brave. Well, I thought it was important to be out in public, but also to show imperfection. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, the, the, the radio show was the same. I wasn't gonna try to do too much to my voice. You know, I, I do the best I can, but you know, um, there, when I first came out at the Fantasia Fair in 1990, I was so struck the very first morning I was there, there were cross nurses and transsexuals from all across the country and from other countries. But the ones who, who just had the hugest impact on me were the one where, and it was all male to female at this event at this time. That there were one or the two first FTMs. Yeah, there were one or two FTMs kind of, but um, the ones who struck me most deeply were the cross-dressers and, and, and trans women who, whose bodies had clearly been very male, who, who were heavy set had he or had heavy beards, who had faces that were very masculine and who were, uh, or, you know, just were much, much taller and bigger and heavier than me. And I just thought, my God, these people, they have so much more courage than I do. What have I been doing quaking in my boots all these years when these people who probably, who may never pass, um, are, have the courage to stand up and go out in public in Provincetown, which is what the Fantasia Fair was all about, um, and be themselves, be true to their inner selves. So um, just, admitting Robin Goldstein who oh, just joined amazing. us. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but you know, there have been so many people of courage um, who've gotten no accol accolades, who um, have suffered, people who dared to be themselves, who were killed for it. Um, yes. who, and more this year than any other year. The, the fact that I've been able to do what I have is, is way more a measure of my privilege than it is a measure of my character. And um, it's, you know, I was fortunate to be in a position and to have the tools and to have the economic freedom to do what I did. But um, what I did was, you know, I'm just saying that there are so many other people who have fought harder, who have suffered longer, um, who have worked more, um, who don't get recognized. And um, I just always feel humbled on occasions like this because I know that I was a lucky one. Not that, not that I was, you know, I didn't pull myself up by my bootstraps. I didn't live on the street like Gunnar Scott did before he rose to become or here the director in, in of Massachusetts. Many First Nation, uh, uh, to Our chair of the women. board here in Albuquerque, um, Bunny, I can't remember her last name, Bunny, 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 Bunny. 
anyway, it yeah, it'll come to me. I am brain dead. Um, our chair is a trans woman who was formerly on the street, formerly drug addicted, and she is now so dedicated to helping her so brothers and sisters. Remarkable. So there are so many remarkable people out there, and we have such, you know, I never knew what community was until I discovered the transgender community, and I never knew the power of community. Um, the transgender community has largely lifted itself with the help of our of our brother and sister communities. But the more we build on our community, the more we build coalition and collaboration, then the more powerful we all become. And we can with, we're, with, we're withstanding the assault from the right right now. We have the nastiest people in charge of this country right now, and yet we're still doing pretty well. We're not doing too bad considering everything. So that's a testimony to our strength, our commitment to one another. Um, it's our solidarity that gives us our strength. And it, it's, it goes beyond local, it goes to the national and to the global in terms of human rights and the uh, rights for bodily integrity and, and oh, so yeah. many more, the Yogarta uh, principles uh, around, around human rights and around gender expression. and and sexuality and uh and those rights should be guaranteed and unfortunately we have too many repressive regimes as in our own country who try to wipe out uh public and private uh transgender um and non uh gender conforming uh identities and certainly particularly in the bodies of uh persons of of color who are under great attack for the uh, overt racism that, that we have. Yeah, and as queer folks, uh, we, we, we have to be an ally in racist issues if it hasn't been obvious that that's where we're well, coming from. Well, and that, from. I think that's important in terms of, and that's something you've always done, Nancy, which I've always admired, is you've always reached across the table, you have two, uh, Grace, Grace in, in terms of joining with other with other movements, and out here in the Southwest, one of the the movements and and one of the needs is the way and and in uh, Boston as well, uh, Matoi Monroe of uh, United American uh, Indians of New England has always been a supporter of uh, transgender rights and in tandem, we were always supportive of, uh, of Matoi's event. Out here, um, we, uh, we are very supportive of what Red Nation uh, is doing. And Red Nation is led by indigenous uh, women and uh, and queer people. We're so we're so lucky to be represented by Deb Holland. Yes, um, a Native American woman who has elected yes. our state representative. Um, she is awesome, and she is a huge supporter of the trans community. Yes, we're on a first name basis with her. She yeah, she has personally called me to thank me for my work. Yes, yeah, she um, comes to our events. She comes to our events. Um, we're so fortunate, and it's, it has been staggering to me to be here in New Mexico and hear about what is still happening to our Native American uh, citizens and communities. Um, it's, but the amazing movement that's happened it's incredible. as well, and how yeah. we can all support each other around different causes, but how those causes intersect. Speaking of supporting one another, I want to recognize Robin Goldstein, who's joined us. Robin. Uh, who we just mentioned a little while yeah, ago. Yeah, <laughs> she was our, my first guest on, on Gender Talk, and she's a, a strong and proud um, gender transgressive voice out there. She was with us at uh, Fall City, Nebraska, when we demonstrated on behalf of Brandon and Tina, and um, just a stalwart. Anyway, are there any questions? Is anybody? Uh, have anything or have we not covered anything? <laughs> I would I would encourage people um, to either you can if you put a question in the chat box I'll read it out um, but you should also feel free to 
I think I think we can I think we can handle this if we just unmute ourselves to ask questions. Um, you should also feel free to do that. Well, Gunnar, there's something from Gunnar. Was there something from Gunnar? Yeah. yeah. Well. Just scroll down. Okay. And well, Dan you know, we've is been... now Jake Rich. That's important. Oh, I'm mention. sorry, Jake. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, Jake. Yeah. Yeah. If you're watching this, you know when when. Uh, when the, when uh, Jake was uh, transitioning, um, he had a radio show called uh, what was his radio show called? Debbie does no. Dallas, Debbie does Dallas, right? Initially. And De and and so we had a conversation, and and Jake then Debbie was saying, I don't know what to call my new show. Now, understand Debbie when when Debbie had handed over the radio show to me, um, she said you can call it whatever you want. You can even call it Gender Talk. So she and so it became name. gender talk. And so when Deb said to me, uh, Deb, who was becoming Jake, Eight said to me, later. Uh, said, I don't know what to call it. I said, well, call it Jake's Juke Joint. And so he did. And Jake did a wonderful show. And, yeah. and was, you know, WMBR was a wonderful radio station. They were yeah. very welcoming yeah. and respectful. Never caught any shade from anybody in any way. Yeah. It was really quite a wonderful experience. Have we talked everybody's ears off? Any ears left? Can I, can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, please. Oh, hi, hi, Nancy. This is Neil Kane from the History Project. Hi. And thank you so much for this incredible, the two of you for this presentation. Um, and my question was, if you, when you think back to that first, you know, fair in Provincetown <clears throat> and the kind of the beginning of the trans journey, and if you were to project to today, do you think, do you think more in terms of how far the community has come or how much further things have to go or is, is it some combination of those two things for you well well you know it's just a continuous process isn't it you know um i always used to say you know we're just the most recent community to come out of the closet we don't know who's going to follow we don't know who's invisible to us right now that is going to become visible and so what what i hope that we are doing is laying the groundwork for whatever is coming. And I have no clue what the next generation is going to bring. Um, but um, we, I think that um, the feminists, and first of all, the abolitionists and the feminists and the, the uh, gay and lesbian and bi communities and now the trans communities and the, the queer and, and, and gender non-conforming communities. I think what we're all about is respect for individuality, um, but respect, respect. The one thing that's missing from the current uh, presidency, respect for everyone, respect for individual choice, respect for individual spirit because it really is a spiritual thing your gender is really about your spirit it's you know i can't explain why uh, i mean I, I i i identify as a trans woman i know that i am somebody who combines elements of both genders or, or many genders um i will never be someone who is born female but I'll also never be somebody who was born male who ne never lived as a woman. So I have elements of both. And yet, for some reason, it matters to me to be pronounced as feminine. To, it matters to hear feminine pronouns and to be called Nancy. Why? It's just part of my spirit. It's just part of who I am. I don't understand it. It was when I let go of the need to understand and let myself be swept away by a caring community that my life finally got itself in order. Yeah, thank you, that's beautiful. Really great. Thank you, Neil. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? You good? Hey, yeah, Terry, welcome yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we're taking questions. <laughs> I think we, we've gone on quite a bit. How about, uh, a, how about a quick comment, since you are still on? Uh, I don't know how many people are on this because I'm on my phone, so I can just see one cell at a time. Oh, uh, there's 20. 
Awesome. 21 now. <laughs> Terrific. Um, Nancy, I am so proud of you. Oh. And I am just blessed, as many, many of us are, to have you and your courage. I remember a long time ago when you said to me, Terry, I want to be who you are. And I always <laughs> thought you were going to come out. I always thought you were gay. I thought that you were a gay guy. Uh, and that when, to came out to you, <laughs> that when I came out to you, you would come out to me. And you didn't. And that was okay, because I didn't think you were ready. And so just to afford you your own time. And you just told me you had something someday you would tell me. Um, and so, you know, and there we, I think we went to some of the first clubs together, you know, in the family and things and just, uh, so I love you so much and what you have been willing to do and step up and do I remember you coming to me one time and saying, if I have to take a bullet, I'll take a bullet. If I need to die for this, I'll die for this. No. And that's who you are, Nancy. And it's because of you. I'll raise my own flag for a second. I've, uh, I've been an out lesbian for over 30 years. Um, a lot longer than that, probably. I remember a lot of the grassroots stuff in Boston. That's when I, where I grew up. And that you brought your community to be able to be out there in the pride parade and to feel what it feels like to just be regular, whatever that means for the person. So thank you so much. I am so blessed to have you as my sister and just so proud of you. Oh. Back at you, sister. You know how much I love so, you. That's congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. I, absolutely. I've ordered Thai food, so now I'm going to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my birthday. Yay. Okay. Yay. I love Thank you. Terry. Love to Terry, everyone. You, you too. Love have to everyone that's listening and watching. Many blessings from the, the Southwest Desert. <laughs> you inspire me, Terry. Thank you. Good night. Love Good night. you, Terry. Love you. Love you. Love to everybody. Bye-bye. Oh. Okay, I don't know if anybody wants to try to follow that. Uh, I see <laughs> Ron wiping her eyes. You're, you're very welcome um, to, you know, to, to, to try to follow that up. But uh, I think we will be... Uh, actually, um, Nancy, do you, have, do you have your award? Can you hold it up? So we can officially congratulate you. Look at that. It looks great. Congratulations, Congratulations to Nancy. Nancy. Yay. Thank you, Gordine. Thank you. That was, Thank you. I think really, I, I said it as a joke to heal our soul at the beginning. And uh, joke's on me because you did it. I'm feeling, I'm feeling so energized and hopeful um, good, good. for sharing that. So, so we really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to gently transition into asking people for money. Um, so over the course of the, <laughs> of the month of October, uh, we want to continue doing this. We want to continue celebrating our, our honorees as well as LGBTQ History Month. Um, and the History Project is aiming to raise $25,000 to support our work. Uh, work that ranges from building archival collections that tell the complex and diverse histories of our LGBTQ community, to, to providing spaces, both in person and online like this one, where community members can come together to learn, to tell their own stories, and to share in creating LGBTQ history. Um, and as of tonight, we have raised 40% towards our $25,000 goal. Um, and so your support tonight, if you can, and throughout the month, is what makes our work possible. It's what makes it possible for us to put together in-person and online events that hopefully challenge and inform and entertain. Uh, your support makes it possible for our activist and archivist volunteers to have a safe place to organize and to preserve the historical records, photographs, and publications that tell our community's story. And your support is what makes it possible for us to digitize those historical materials so we can share them with community members and researchers around the world. Uh, we all have stories to tell, and it's the mission of the History Project to document and preserve those stories and to share them with the world. Um, so we hope that you'll make a donation tonight to help the History Project reach our fundraising goal. Uh, visit 
historyproject.org slash support to make a donation. And that's already been put in the chat, block, chat box for you. Um, so we hope you visit that link and, uh, and contribute whatever you're able to if you enjoy the programming that we did tonight. Um, going forward, we hope you really hope we really hope you tell others about the History Project um, and the kind of work that it does, which is just talking about this event. Uh, we hope that you berate your group texts and your close friends to follow the History Project on Instagram um, and to sign up for this event series because we're here every Thursday in October. Um, so we're celebrating our history our history makers all month. So next month next Thursday, we hope you'll come back. Uh, we'll be joined by our History Maker Award honoree and one of my personal heroes, uh, Dr. Kenneth Mayer. Dr. Mayer uh, is the founding med medical research director of Fenway Health and the co-chair of the Fenway Institute and one of the first clinical researchers in Boston to see patients with HIV and AIDS. So that again, that's Thursday, uh, next Thursday. It'll be the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we really thank you all for your support. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, of course, uh, to Nancy and to Gordine for, for that terrific talk today. We'll, we'll give you, I see people applauding in the chat, so I have, I'm unmuted, I'll do it for you. This is terrific. Thanks everybody, have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Nancy and Gordine, that was amazing. I need to go collect myself. <laughs> oh. uh, that was nice of my sister. Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. Oh, bye. did you go, Grace? Yes. Uh, do you know how Monica died? You know, I 